morning. Uh, it usually scares Californians off, but uh, glad to see you're all here. Uh, we do see a few people are missing out of town, traveling, uh, some sick, so we need to keep them in our prayers as well. We had a really great class this morning. I hope if you were uh, able to join in class that uh, you got something out of the class you were in. I just want to emphasize, um, if, if all you get of Bible is once a week Sunday morning in my sermon, you're not getting enough. Uh, that we need to be engaged with God on a daily basis. That is one of the great joys of my job is that I'm actually paid to be engaged with God on a daily basis. That I am paid to study the word, to contemplate what is it God's trying to teach us? What is it God wants us to accomplish? What is it that God wants to do in our own lives? What, it, what does he want to forgive? What, where does he want us to grow? And that's always part of an ongoing process. Uh, one of the things we, we discussed this morning in our class was the fact that we're always in process. Um, if anyone ever thinks they have arrived, they haven't. They're nowhere close. That we're always in process, walking closer and closer to God, and that's why we come together on Sunday mornings. That's why we come together to encourage each other, why we come to sit at the Lord's table and, and remind each other and remind God of, of and he often um, sort of moves through the story to where you need to remember where we are in order to find the story today. So you remember last week, Gabriel had showed up and told two women they're going to have babies. And it was quite a shock to both, since one was so old she didn't think she could possibly have children, and one wasn't even married yet. And Gabriel shows up, and he does his angel thing and tells them they're about to have babies kids and, and their cousins and so Mary goes to visit Elizabeth and, and she goes to visit her and, and it says she was in her sixth month and it says she stayed three months and then went home so when Mary goes back home Elizabeth's getting pretty close now you got to also remember that Zachariah her husband when Gabriel showed up he didn't believe him says, you're going to have a kid, and he was like, right. <laughs> Me and my wife are a little old, if you know what I'm saying. And, and, and so the angel says, you know, you're not going to talk. Your tongue will be tied until this comes to pass. And that's where we pick up the story this morning. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had showed her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came together to circumcise the child they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There's no one among your relatives who has that name. Apparently it was the custom to name him after the father, and we still have that custom today. And, and, and so the mom says, no. Well, in this society, the dad was the one who named the kids, but of course, Zachariah can't talk. So they said, we'll call him Zachariah, and mom steps up and says, oh, no, no, we're going to call him John. And they're wondering, why is she so adamant? Well, one way to deal with this, they'll just get a hold of uh, Dad here. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment wrote, His name is John. Now he wrote it, but you could hear it, you know what I'm saying? His name is John. Immediately. This is what got everyone's attention. Immediately, his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were filled with awe. Now that's a nice word, but another way to put that is scared to death, <laughs> terrified. 
The neighbors were filled with awe, and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, What then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. Now what you see going on here is a very old principle. If you've got a big story to tell, if you've got a big announcement to come out, they still do it today in Hollywood that's called Buzz. You'll see a flash. I always, I, I hate Buzz myself. You know, you, you, some exciting scene from an action movie will show up and then it doesn't even give you a title. It just says, coming soon. And you, what, what, I, I, what was the name of I, And they do that for a while. They, they, they want to create a buzz. They want people to start being anxious for the rest of the story, for, for what's going on. And you see what's going on here? These guys aren't going to start doing much for 30 years. Both John and Jesus won't be in their ministries until they're about 30. That's when, when Jewish society can, considers you old enough to be listened to. That you are actually a man. You know, we think of becoming a man. We, we have our legal age of adulthood and all that stuff. But in Jewish society, and as I've mentioned, in, in Africa, if you're not 30, you don't have anything to say worth listening to on any given day. And of course in Kenya, it was you got to be married, have kids, and be 30. Or otherwise, you just didn't have much to tell anybody. I figured you didn't have the life experience. And so, so John and Jesus aren't going to start anything for 30 years, and yet... Look at all that's going on. Look at the buzz that is being created to where all through the whole hill country now they're saying, we're going to have to watch this kid. Now, you know, people said that about me when I was younger, but it wasn't usually in positive terms. <laughs> we have to watch this one. But they're all talking about there's something, okay, you got Zachariah and Elizabeth, they're so old, they can't possibly have kids, and then she gets pregnant. And he can't talk. And they all wonder, there was a little story about something happening at the temple, and no one really knew because he couldn't tell anyone. And then the kid's born, and there's this confusion about the name. And he writes down on the tablet, no, his name's going to be John, and suddenly he's able to speak again. Yeah, that would create, you know, in a little town, the hill country, that would create a buzz. People would start talking, people would start anticipating. And as they watch John grow up, you can almost see, the, that's the one. Remember him? Look out for him. Yeah, I don't want you playing too late over at their house, because, you know, something, you know, every, everyone would kind of know but no one would say anything out loud. What's interesting here is, as far as we can tell, Luke never met John the Baptist. Luke, the doctor who traveled with Paul, was never had a face-to-face -face encounter. He became a Christian after John had been executed by Herod. And so he never met him, and yet he seems quite fascinated with him. He had obviously heard a lot about John the Baptist. Can you imagine a first generation Christian Gentile who starts hearing the story of Jesus but you hear about this other character John the Baptist before Jesus ministry John the Baptist was out proclaiming behold the kingdom of heaven is at hand and, and he was proclaiming you know, make way and he was, he was that herald that ran before the king to announce everyone that he's coming and, and, and for, a, for a new Christian who didn't know much about Judaism and didn't, you know, new to Christianity to hear these stories, he, he was obviously very familiar with Jesus. He would have heard the gospel, but, but he's, he seems fascinated with this character, John the Baptist. You can almost tell Luke wished he had known him. He certainly had talked to some people who did know him. And, and, and so he, he's heard a lot, and when he begins his gospel, he can't leave John the Baptist out. It's it's interesting, his account of John's birth, if you look at it, he's actually got a little more ink for John the Baptist's birth than for Jesus. You can kind of tell that he, he wants to make a big deal out of John the Baptist. And you, you start to recall in Acts where he actually, people were running into disciples of John the Baptist. 
You remember those stories? Paul's running around and he meets these guys who are preaching the kingdom of God. He, they sound like Christians, but, but there's something not quite right. He says, when did you guys get the spirit? And they said, we didn't, we didn't know there was a spirit. And he realizes they only knew the baptism of John. The fact is, John the Baptist had quite an impact in Israel, in Judea, before Jesus started his ministry. And we know that James and John were actually disciples of John the Baptist before they became disciples of Jesus. But what's interesting is Christianity starts to spread out into the Roman world. You have Christians running into other folks that sound a lot like Christians, but they're not. They're followers of John the Baptist. They had heard the message, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the Messiah is coming, but they had never connected with Jesus yet. There's another famous story, you probably remember this one better, where you have Priscilla and Aquila run into this guy, Apollos. And he's, he's got this great speaking voice, he's this great orator, and he's preaching what sounds right, but they realize there's something missing, and they, they, they realize he's a disciple of John the Baptist. And it says they take him home and they just explain the scriptures more clearly to him. And he becomes a Christian. So as Luke's traveling and he knows these characters, Priscilla and Aquila, he knows Apollos, he knows these guys, he, he hears about John the Baptist and he realizes the impact that they were running into disciples of John out in the Roman world who hadn't heard the message of Jesus yet. And so I think Luke's a little, little fascinated with this character of John the Baptist and has to go into it a little more. The birth of John, we've got an older woman giving birth to a baby boy. That would wake everybody in the community up, especially her. You had the circumcision and naming party. That usually went together in Jewish society at that time, and they, they'd get together, and they're all scheduled. They're ready. They call the family together, and... And, you know, it might seem a little strange that you'd have a party around a circumcision, but to the Jewish community at that time, that was a big deal. Everyone would come. You'd have a big meal. It was a feast. It was a party. But there's a problem. The name. Now, you wouldn't think this would be a problem. Most people, you know, you know you're pregnant. You start thinking about names. And, you know, you assume they're going to follow the traditional name. And so they get to this situation where Zachariah's locked up with his speech and the wife's calling out a name nobody's even heard of. They're sure she must have gone crazy off the deep end somehow. You can't name a kid a name that no relative of yours has. And they get him to write it down, but you see, he remembers Gabriel. You can see Zachariah sitting there, can't you? They're all having a fuss about what to call this kid. And they want to call it after Zechariah. They assume he will back that up, right? It's dead. This is probably going to be his only child. You can see him listening and remembering Gabriel. You're going to call the kid John. And because you didn't believe me, you're not going to be able to talk until this happens. And now John has been born. He's not going to put, we'll call him Peter. We'll call him Mephibosheth. We'll call him anything. No, what he, his name is John. And immediately he's able to talk. Can you imagine not being able to just not being able to talk for nine months? And suddenly you're able to talk. And he immediately starts praising God. I mean, what an impact. And you can see in his you talk about conviction. This is what the angel told me. This is what we're going to do. And his voice is freed at that point. And it says the neighbors were all filled with awe, terror. Throughout the hill country of Judea, people were talking about all of these things. Everyone who heard his, this wondered about it, asking, what then? Is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was with him. 
we're going to have to watch this kid. Something's going on. And we're not sure what, but we want to find out. Again, Luke building the anticipation. And then he moves on. Once again, Luke shows his ability to tell a story by saying, oh yeah, John got is born and this happens and everyone's talking about it and now let's talk about something else. But you know, it's to be continued. I hate those. I watch a lot of series on TV and it gets to that big exciting moment and then tune in next week. Oh, man. Well, that's what Luke's doing. Tells the story about John the Baptist. You know there's more to come. He's not going to stop there, but he, he then switches to the birth of Jesus, just like any good storyteller would do. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph went up from Judea of Nazareth, went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to a firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. story many of us, most of us, are very, very familiar with. Even if you didn't spend your life in church, you couldn't miss the nativity story around Christmas. And it's fascinating as we read through this again to sort of see it again. But, but let's see it as it is. One of the things that bothers me, and there's a lot of things that bother me about Christmas, but, but this is one of those things, is when you see those nativity scenes, they're always beautiful, gorgeous. Everything's perfect. The straw in the manger is perfect. Gold. There's no dirt. There's no mud. The wood is nice and sanded and flat and smooth. The animals don't smell. If you understand what's really going on here, you realize we've sort of cleaned everything up for the birth of Jesus when the fact of the matter is it's portrayed just as it is. It was crowded. Bethlehem's not a big place. Hotels filled up fast, and the only place for them to get in out of the cold to find shelter was out with the animals in the barn. And Luke makes that very clear. He just keeps it very simple, and he just says they had to put him in a manger in an animal feeding trough because there just wasn't anywhere else to put him. And you understand that a little better if you've had some third world experience. This is where my mission work and, and what we experience in Kenya helps out. When you go out into a village, well, let me put it this way. In Kenya, you knew how to find the highway because it was the paved roads. It was the one paved road. And, and you got into a village as soon as you left got into a village, you left the pavement. And so the roads were messed up, they were rutted, they were muddy, they were dirty, all the water filled into the deep holes, and then people drove around and that created other deep holes. And then when you went into a village, there was nothing that was really clean in the streets. And so you can see how if there was no room in the end, they weren't about to just, you know, hey, let's just go camp out. There's no nice place to camp. You, you want to get in a barn, that's the best option you have. And Luke paints that picture. Keeps it simple. Time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to the firstborn the son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger to keep him out of the dirt. Because there was no room for that. 
And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord showed around them, and they were terrified. Angels again. Scared to death. But this angel had obviously been trained properly. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Because they all know it's the first thing you got to say to these human beings. Angels show up. They freak out. you got to let them know it's okay. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all. And this is an interesting phrase in Luke. Be for all the people. He didn't say for Israel. He didn't say for, for those of us here in Judea. He said, I bring you good news for all the people. You say, well, does that mean everyone? And as my sister loves to say, what are you having trouble with, the A or the two L's? <laughs> all. That's quite a message. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into the heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem to see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us. It kind of left an impression on these guys. You know, they didn't sit there and say, Oh, angels again. Boy, if I had a nickel for every time I, you know. <laughs> I mean, this was quite the occurrence. These shepherds have been out in these same fields watching the same stars every night, and this had never happened before. And it's interesting that they showed up to the shepherds. This is not the uh, upper echelon of society, even today. Now, these guys are just poor shepherds out in the fields around Bethlehem. Of course, there's one interesting thing about shepherds around Bethlehem. That's where David came from, the great shepherd king. So if you were a shepherd, it wasn't really a high standing, but you could, you could claim a little extra status if you were a shepherd around Bethlehem. I imagine any time someone made fun of them, they said, you know, David was a shepherd around Bethlehem. They said they had to go see this thing. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. But Mary treasured up all of these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which is just as they had been told. I mean, it's one thing for an angel to show up out in the field and say, you know, something great's happened. But to go into Bethlehem and find it just like the angels had said it, that probably got these guys pretty excited. And they made sure they told everybody. So let's get back to the text a little bit. Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem to the town of David because he belonged to the house and line of David. Now Luke is trying to get you to understand that just because he's from Nazareth doesn't mean he's not connected to the royal line. So as he starts telling this story, he's got to get Joseph back to Bethlehem, which is where the Messiah was to be born, someone in the line of David. So his interest here is to connect Jesus with the royal family of David, and he points that out in this process. They had this big census. They had to go to their hometown. Excuse me. And so they ended up back there. 
It's also interesting, though, he, t he mentions the census, and how Luke's pointing out that God's running things. I mean, we sort of think we do. We sort of think we're in control. But the fact is, it says the emperor had a census over the whole Roman world. Luke points out, now, he thought he was doing this for the whole Roman world, but what he was really doing was getting Joseph back to Bethlehem at the right time. It was a matter of timing, and God used the emperor of the world empire of Rome to make sure he got everything lined up and in place. You can almost see God like the great director that he is. As the moment was approaching, I can just see him, you know, two, one, action. Tiberius writes out this thing. I think I'll have a census. And they send out the letters. Had to go out at the right time so it reached the right place so that everyone would start gathering. And Joseph ends up going to Bethlehem. God's the one orchestrating things. And he can use even Roman emperors to do his work. He's the one that makes things happen. I've always liked that. One, uh, one Hebrew scholar was pointing out that we get the term Yahweh, we have the consonants, but we don't know the, the vowels being used. And so the best way to you know, work that out is to come up with Yahweh vowels. And in Hebrew that means I am that I am. But, you know, you could adjust the vowels a little and it could be translated, I'm the one who makes it happen. And, you know, I like both of those. But I, I kind of like that one. I'm the one who makes it happen. God is the one who is in charge and we need to remind ourselves. I appreciated Jason's talk this morning, communion, because we get so lost in the noise that we forget who's in charge. We sometimes think we're in charge and we've really forgotten that we serve God and that he's the one running things. And if we want to accomplish a lot, what we need to do is figure out what God's calling us to do and then join him in that process. And then we'll see God at work in our lives and truly great things will happen. And that's what's going on here. God's the one who makes it happen. Luke's Christology, just a fancy word for studying his understanding of Jesus, the Christ. He has the angels announced, Today in the town of David a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. He's the first one. The first Jesus' is Savior, then that title's not used in Matthew or Mark. Not in this story. And so Luke brings it out right at the beginning that he has the angels announced he is the savior of the world. The Jews had had a long-standing tradition of waiting for the Messiah. But the savior of the world, that's new. And Luke uses it first. He's the Christ, which is just the, the Latin way of saying Messiah, Messiah. Uh, from the Hebrew. He is the one that's been prophesied about. He's the one that's been expected. And you need to understand the Messiah had been prophesied about for centuries, but the timing had to be right in here somewhere. One of the reasons we know that is there were like, oh, I can't even remember the exact number, but about 48 different Messiahs pop up during this time period when Jesus shows up. A whole bunch of guys had done the math, looked through the prophets, and had figured out this is about the time when the Messiah should show up. And there had been a whole lot of prophecies and a whole lot of people talking about it. And then you have this thing with Jesus and John and their births. And I imagine even more people are talking about it. But they, Luke's saying, this one, this one is the one that we've been expecting. He is Lord Adonai. He is the one who is in charge. This baby in the manger is God with us. The angels announce what Luke is about to elaborate on throughout his gospel. 
He uses the angel's announcement to get people talking, get the buzz started, so they'll want to read the rest of the story. He wants people to understand there is something great going on here, and you're going to want to know about it. Jesus is the one that we've all been waiting for. The shepherds, he focuses on the shepherds to announce the gospel is for all, but particularly to the poor, the lame, the blind. Luke's very focused on the marginal of society, the, the poorer people. He's a doctor. He cares for these people. He's got a lot of compassion. And as you read through Luke, he spends a lot more time talking about Jesus dealing with the poor than with other folks. That's just obviously one of his themes. The shepherds connected Jesus to the shepherd king, and I think that's an important part too. That these aren't just any shepherds. There are shepherds around Bethlehem, and everybody reading this, anyone familiar with the Old Testament, would know this is where the shepherd king came from. And another shepherd king is emerging. In fact, the last one we'll ever need. He also leaves out the kings in this one. I think that's sort of interesting. In the other stories we find, these, uh, the kings of Orientara, the kings that brought the frankincense and myrrh, and, and other people came and, and paid homage to Jesus. Not in Luke's story. Luke wants to focus on the Gospels for the poor, the Gospels for the mar marginalized. And I don't think he's trying to leave the others out deliberately, but he wants to keep the focus there. He wants to let them know this is a Gospel that reaches poor folks. And he leaves the royalty out. The manger is meager. The shepherds are lowly. But the glory of Yahweh fills the story. And that's what Luke is trying to accomplish in this little place here. Call to action. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds had said to them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Now I'm fascinated with that phraseology because you read in 1 John, he starts his whole gospel, his whole letter out by saying, that which was from the beginning, that which we have seen and heard. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. That this was a phrase in the early church, what have you seen and heard? Tell people what you have seen and heard. That was the essence of witnessing or, or testimony. What have you seen and heard of this Jesus? And we need to understand as a church, that's our job. We're not just the angels, messengers of God. We're the shepherds running around in the streets saying, we've seen Jesus. We have experienced the Messiah. We want to tell you about it. Because if you've seen Jesus, if you've heard Jesus, if you've experienced Jesus, you can't keep quiet. We are the shepherds. We need to share all that we know, all that we've seen, all that we've heard. If you have any needs this morning, please come as we stand and sing.